Hello friends, my apologies for the long break between videos. I had some discrepancies in the calculations that needed to be worked out before I felt comfortable presenting this portion of the theory. At this point, I believe they are all worked out consistently, and so let's have some fun with it. This presentation will focus on the construction of the space-time and time-space representations utilized in previous episodes to explain gravity, dark energy, and time. I will use both quantum and relativistic concepts in uniting them within this model to prepare for the next episodes, where we will derive the time-space field equations which reveal the geometry and missing terms in the Einstein field equations. Let's start with our space-time orbit, this orbit being responsible for the generation of baryon matter in our universe, discussed in episode 1 about gravity and time. Consider that the equations here are simply the force equations for an orbit where the masses are equal and the orbital velocity is the speed of light. Canceling out one of the mass terms gives us a set of time orbit equations, which simply make the math simpler to follow. We are going to consider here that this orbit can in fact have quantum degrees of freedom. By that I mean we can consider all possible movement vectors which still allow the time orbit equations to be satisfied. Our first degree of freedom to consider is that directionality of the orbital velocity can be ambiguous with regards to xy, xz, and yz planes. This produces a spherical surface with fixed rotational distance, orbital acceleration, and velocity. Thus the time orbit equation is satisfied. Next. Since directional motion is arbitrary for quantum systems with no external reference, we can say that every point on the orbital surface can be adjacent to a mirror image orbital where its directional orbital velocity microstate is equivalent. Filling in all mirror image microstates in a plane around a point on the surface creates a torus structure. And as if that wasn't cool enough, we can combine all rotational planes in 3D space, giving us our space-time representation which represents all possible degrees of freedom and directional microstates which satisfy the orbit equations. The resulting space-time representation appears to be a 3D sphere made of 2D surfaces. However, realize firstly that we constructed this representation around an arbitrary point on the surface of the space-time orbit, and second, that the orbit itself is in fact also a dimension, the time-spatial dimension. When we consider orbital motion, here showing this motion in a 2D slice of spacetime, we can in fact see that spacetime is a 4D sphere, also known as a hypersphere, where all points on the sphere rotate through the center in time. However, from the perspective of static time spatial dimension, all points are in fact at the center of the sphere, each point representing a different microstate reflection of the entire system. This can perhaps be best understood by the fact that every point in our universe is at the center of the universe, since the same distance to the Hubble horizon is observed for every point. So yes, you are the center of the universe, but so is everyone and everything. And I want to suggest here that one philosophical interpretation of all points in the universe being the same point is that all consciousness in the universe is the same consciousness experiencing itself in countless individualized microstates, where the sense of self is determined by our surroundings in space and time, nature and nurture, respectively. There is ample evidence, I believe, that helps support this idea, which I will discuss in the philosophical section of this channel. Returning to our space-time hypersphere orbital, I want to point out that the orbit equations can be rearranged to the Schwarzschild equation, typically used to describe the event horizon of black holes. Here we have the Schwarzschild radius of our observable universe at twice the Hubble horizon distance. The relationship occurs because the Schwarzschild equation itself represents a type of dimensional boundary. This will be discussed in future episodes. This is also suggestive that there is motion taking place rotationally, centered at two times the Hubble horizon. And indeed, in a later episode, we will expound upon this to understand how the phenomenon of dark matter is generated rotationally at the universal scale. Next, we will generate the time-space dimension, which is the next dimension up from space-time. This can be done by simply considering that in space-time, microstates are considered from a single location in the space-time orbit. In other words, only one position in time is experienced at once. If we consider instead a dimension where all points in the space-time orbit are experienced spatially, then our movement vector becomes the time-spatial dimension of the previous dimension, thus allowing 3D motion in time for each point, and geometrically understood to be the straightening out of the circumference of space-time orbit into a diameter for the new dimension. Recognize that time-space is also a hypersphere, and thus four-dimensional. However, its 3D spatial dimension portion is made up of possibilities in our time dimension. Thus, 3D time is experienced spatially, not temporally. 
with matter in this dimension appearing as probability distributions of macroenergetic possibilities from spacetime. Comparatively, matter in our spacetime, after all, just being probability distributions of quantum energetic possibilities. This connection will be fleshed out in more detail when we discuss dimensions at the particle scale. Note also that the 1D spatial dimension in time-space is not the 1D analog of our 3D space, but a greater cycle one dimension up and would likely be experienced more like durational time. Now, by looking at a 2D slice of the space-time hypersphere, we can directly unfold the space-time's time orbital into time-space's linear spatial dimension with accompanying new super-time orbital. Here, we can clearly see that the relationship between these dimensions is thus related algebraically by pi, and structurally why both space-time and time-space overlap in the space-time region, which gives rise to the gravitational attraction between these regions, leading to the phenomenon known as dark energy, as discussed in an earlier episode. So perhaps the natural next question is, why stop at the time Time, space, and spacetime with this radius to circumference dimensional transformation. The truth is, I see no reason why it isn't an infinite series that both shrinks and grows to infinity. A friend of mine who specializes in abstract mathematics is taking a swing at constructing the function linking these structures together, and I'm quite excited to see it once he's done, at the point where the transformations occur at both extremes. Each hypersphere dimensional level should be perpendicular to the last and so this feature should appear in the function. The question, of course, of the Planck length then comes into question. Why does it exist? What does that length represent? What I believe has to do with dimensional accessibility within the space-time dimension which we inhabit. Those familiar with M-theory, or better known as string theory, will recognize that dimensionality in this theory is very different. It doesn't involve small Planck length curled up dimensions. In fact, what we will discuss in later episodes is that these dimensions repeat in both the small and large scales. The idea of infinite dimensions is probably daunting to many, especially to those theories that can find dimensionality. But if that's how existence is, I think we're just going to have to accept the concept of eternity. Clearly, it's something I contemplate regularly. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will address them as best I can. Until next time, thanks for your attention and I hope you found this interesting. Much love.